First talk today is going to be on technical training and shop equipment, and that will be Mike Martin from PennDOT, and he's the Division Chief of Fleet Management. So I'll turn it over to Mike. Uh, I'm Mike with PennDOT, uh, Division Chief. I've been the Division Chief for about three years, um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about our training, our mechanic training program. Just a little background on PennDOT, our, our organization, particularly on the fleet side. Pennsylvania has 11 engineering districts within the districts. Uh, there's a district equipment manager, and the fleets uh, at the district level, for the most part, are pool cars, uh, assigned cars. Uh, each district has a, a paint machine that they uh, manage and repair and take care of. Then in, within the districts, uh, we have 67 counties. Uh, each county has a, an office and a garage, uh, and on the garage side of the house, there's an equipment manager. Depending on the size of the county. They have one or two uh, mech supervisors and of course the mechanics and welders and all those folks. Then at fleet management at central office where I'm at and that's a picture of, of the front of our building. We also have a garage. Uh, we have a pool fleet. Uh, we manage all the uh, vehicles assigned in pool fleet within central office and then the pavement uh, testing equipment that we manage all that and repairs. We also have the equipment specifications unit all the equipment is spec through uh, our office. Uh, we're the only agency and within, Penn, within the Commonwealth that purchases their own equipment. Uh, everybody else goes through the Department of General Services. All the equipment, when it's purchased, comes to Harrisburg. Uh, we go over it, review it, uh, make, making sure everything's good to go uh, before we, we release it to the counties uh, and the districts. We also have an engine rebuild shop. Uh, which is pretty exciting. We have a dyno. The, the folks in that department uh, are really dedicated to rebuilding engines, and it's a pretty good program, and, and uh, we continue to keep that going. We also have a warehouse. The warehouse, our warehouse, is a little different than, than at the county office. We're basically, if we can buy in bulk and get a, a cost savings, we have it in our warehouse. Then we also have the DPF cleaning. So right now, we're really looking really hard at that. Our interval is four years. So the MEC-2 will get a, a notification through SAP that, hey, this truck, the DPF filter needs cleaned. Um, but what we're finding is, is that interval right? Because we all know once we start tear it apart, then we have all those issues with tearing the component apart. So we're looking at that uh, to try to come up with uh, a, a better uh, cycle on that. What happens there a lot of times is that each district has a pony truck. Uh, so there's 11 pony trucks coming out. They visit Harrisburg once a week. Typically, if they have a filter that needs clean, they come to us first. Uh, we inspect it. If it passes that to be cleaned, we clean it. If not, we give them a new filter. Uh, but they'll stop with us first, typically, and then they'll run down the street to the sign shop to pick up signs and run over driver's licensing and all the inner office mail. And hopefully, by the time they get back, filter's ready to go, they can take it back to their district and county. Uh, for PennDOT, we have 11 district garages. There's 67 counties. There's one county that's real small. It doesn't have a garage. Uh, so we have 66 garages uh, at the county level and, of course, one at fleet management. So there's 78 garages uh, within PennDOT. Our training department, they have an equipment manager that's in charge of training. He has not only the mechanic side of the house, but also the operator. And just real quickly on the operator side, uh, we have two training facilities, one on the east and one on the west for operators. Every operator must go through the two-week truck and loader training. Then we also have three core pieces of equipment. There are also two-week trainings uh, that are at those sites, and that's the uh, grader, excavator, and backhoe. Uh, they come for the training and certification. All other equipment is done locally at the county with the county operator instructors, and the certifications are done by the equipment managers uh, locally. We also have the uh, third-party CDL examiners, which that continues to change. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the ELDT uh, final rule, how that all pans out. It, it goes in cycles. Uh, right now, you know, the difficulty of getting mechanics and, and operators, we're doing a lot of uh, Class B um, testing. Uh, we're bringing more folks in right now than we have in the last 10 years on permits. Uh, so that final role will have a big impact. I'm being told 
through conversations with our driver's licensing that we'll be able to certify in-house. Uh, our certifiers will have to go through a, uh, training. It's really not defined at this point, as I understand it, what that will be, that we'll be able to do that in-house. Our, our biggest, uh, and on that side, is our upgrades to a Class A. The last four years, uh, we got approved to bring back annuitants at each site. So we have annuitants, uh, four or five of them at each site uh, due to the number of uh, new employees. So we're doing around 400 plus truck and loader, just truck and loader uh, classes a year, or students, I should say, a year. Then on the uh, mechanic side, we also have a mechanic instructor supervisor and then two mechanic uh, instructors. Right now, we have about five new mechanic sessions a year. It was four for a long time, uh, but now we're up to five. Uh, we average, we've been averaging 60 new mechanic students per year. Uh, well, I should say PennDOT mechanics, because we also have an MOU with the Pennsylvania Turnpike uh, where we train their mechanics. They come in, last year we did 22. Another shot of a, the front of our building. We're averaging about 14 students a class. Uh, we also have mobile uh, mechanic training. The two instructors are going out in the field. They'll visit each district uh, twice a year uh, to do the mobile mechanic training. But the, uh, the new mechanic training that we have is a five-week course. Um, week one and week five are mandatory. Every mechanic must come through. Uh, then weeks two, three, and four they can test out of. But what we find is a lot of mechanics will say, hey, yeah, I, I, I passed the test on electrical, but I passed, but I'm still, in my mind, uh, could use additional training. Uh, we encourage them, sure, come on back. You know, come in for that. You test it out, but please join us. We have some equipment managers that say, hey, you know, I'm sending this, these two mechanics uh, whether they test out or not, I would like to see them attend all five weeks. And we, we uh, encourage that, and that's a good, good deal. So uh, week one is pretty much, which is mandatory, is pretty much penned out policies, uh, work rules. Uh, we have a two-day air brake course, and it's real heavy on our preventive maintenance program. And of course, then, during that first week, we have our, our test out day. Uh, where they can test out of two, three, and four, which is electrical, hydraulic, and diesel engine. And then week five, week five is also mandatory, and that's our spreader systems week. Week one, our ABS break course description. You can see in the description, uh, this course, well, all of our course are, are, are group paced. You know, we're hiring different uh, levels of experience and skills. Uh, so we don't want to let anybody behind. Everything's group paced. Uh, we bring everybody along. Um, this portion is two days uh, just on, on the brake system. Uh, this is one of our training aids that we use for the ABS uh, air brake class. Uh, this simulator covers the Bendix air brake system. Um, we're able to insert faults and failures into the boards for, for the students to diagnose. Uh, this section that we're looking at now is the, is the front part of the truck, and this section is, is, the, is the back half. I don't have a picture of it in the slides, but then we also have the trailer simulator so we can insert failures in any portion uh, for the students to review and diagnose. Oh, this is a, a worksheet for the air brake uh, setup, a handy tool for, those, for the new mechanics to you know, take with them. You know, the newer trucks that have a slack adjuster, maximum 105 degree angle setting when the brake is applied, or the older trucks with the, the 90. Uh, just a tool for those, for the mechanics. Uh, we spend a lot of time on our preventive maintenance program. Uh, right there, we're looking at our 824. Uh, as you can see, it's a, it's a thorough inspection. What we'll do is we'll, we'll bring a truck in, into the class, and it's a hands-on. We do the PM with the mechanics, go over it, the, the whole PM process from start to beginning, uh, all hands-on. As you can see there at the top, uh, some of the boxes are, are in yellow. This is a draft. We're updating it right now. Uh, we have two 
fleet advisors that, that cover the Commonwealth for QAs. They perform two, Q, two QAs in each county uh, per year. The district equipment manager, the, the fleet advisors perform two QAs in each county uh, per year, and then the district equipment manager does a third QA within their district. Um, and, and we gather that, all that information up. We use that as a training aid. We bring all that information back to the new mechanic training. Uh, we use that information to up, update our 824, our QAs. You know, we're in the process of updating it. We have a, a fleet optimization task force uh, that the committee meets once a year. It's a pretty uh, unique or, or a large cross-section of our, our uh, maintenance community. Not only do we have equipment managers, district equipment managers, we have the, a couple uh, assistant district executives from maintenance, uh, maintenance services engineers, district maintenance managers, a good cross-section that comes together. Typically, the meeting was in the end of April. Uh, this year, I changed it up a little bit. Uh, I made it as early as possible to try to get away from snow season. The first week of April, we met and we review the QAs, we review a lot of policy, and that committee is working on with Justin and Dan, they're our fleet managers, our fleet advisors, to update the 824. And the reason I, I, I made it a change in the time, it made it beginning of April, I wanted to have that meeting, get our changes, our updates, because three, two weeks ago, we had our third annual, we call it PEMC, uh, PennDOT Equipment Managers Conference, where we bring all the uh, equipment managers into one location. That's a, a day and a half conference. It's been a huge success. Last year, we were able to have our, we were able to have our first mechanic supervisor conference. I had to have it in three different locations, but this year, uh, we got the approval to have one big conference and bring all the MEC supervisors uh, into one conference, again, a day and a half. Uh, very successful, um, but I wanted to get the task force together so we could communicate. We know, all know what the issues are with a, in a large org organization with communication. So we got those folks in one room and we can talk about the changes and, and, and get that information out to, directly to all those, those folks. Something else that's brand new this year is the Justin and Dan top 10 list. We use that uh, in our new mechanic training. Uh, we use that to help look at our QA process and our 824s and a lot of different policies. What do we need to update? Maybe we had this item in the QA. It really isn't an issue right now, and we were able to make changes that way. So for 2018, and our, our, this is our first top 10, this is what we found where we're having uh, issues, things that are getting missed. Number three there, tires and rims. We're partnering with Department of Corrections, something similar to what Ohio is doing. I was out in Chillicothe the last two year and a half, twice, to see what they, those folks are doing. And Doug, you got a great program out there. Right now, the rim refurbishing line is up and running. Uh, by the end of this calendar year, uh, the whole facility should be in place. It's a 50,000 square foot building. Uh, we're we're going to start out with plows, uh, with the refurbish plows, uh, and then get, work our way into equipment. The sand blast booth that they built is large enough to house uh, a low boy trailer. So we're hoping to get to the point where you know we can take equipment, rollers, loaders, and such to be refurbished. I can say that the very first meeting we had the, when we started talking about rollers and loaders and and all that, uh, the warden's eyes were getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And he's like, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, I want to sleep at night. But we've, we've kind of worked through that pretty exciting uh, process. Number seven, their repair tasks is basically documentation. Uh, we've got mechanic supervisors out there that, you know, tell a really good story by looking at the work order notification. You can very obviously what they did, what the issue was, what the repair was. Uh, then you look at other work orders and you just scratch your head and then you have others that there's no documentation whatsoever. So we're really looking hard at that to get good documentation with our repairs. Threw a couple slides in there of some of the things uh, that we've been seeing. 
Uh, these are trucks that just came out of PM, and the uh, auto greasers are, are not being filled. So uh, we're trying to highlight these issues and uh, get them addressed. I'm sure, we all see that. Locations not getting greased properly, whether it's clogged, tubes broken, whatever the case may be. And of course, manually greased components not being greased. Tire inflation, it's written on the, on the ground there. I think the inner tire was at 108 pounds and the outer at 112, and it should be at 120. Again, these trucks had just come out of PM. That's <laughs> safety. I see a lot of crazy stuff with the uh, bed up indicators, whether they're taking the wires off the audible alarm or taking the bulb out of the, the light, or in this case, they took the switch and, and disabled it by bending it under. Bending it under. So that's week one, which is mandatory. Uh, then week two is electrical diagnostics, which uh, they can test out of. Again, safety, all of our courses, safety is, is very important. Uh, so we talked the first day in electrical about do's and don'ts. Uh, we go around the room to try and engage all the students to ask them, you know, what, what types of electrical hazards have you experienced and, and want to share. And, and some of the stories are quite frightening. But uh, we spent a lot of time on, on that portion on safety. Day two, we cover electrical symbols. And, and again, everything we try to do hands-on. So we show them how to properly repair and replace wiring connectors. Everything's, everything's hands-on. We cover basic multimeter use, uh, then we work through to more advanced usage, component testing, and we're constantly, you see from the picture there, we're trying to uh, update our training aids as we go through this and move forward with the ever-changing technology. Here's another, and the, these boards we're looking at updating, but the students are able to build basic circuits uh, with, the, with the boards and, and understand current flow, and then they, we have testing materials where they could dip, build different circuits. Day five of, of electrical, we talk a lot about common electrical failures with, with our equipment, with PennDOT equipment. Uh, we cover internal bulletins, uh, show them where they're located so they can find them. And of course, unfortunately, we have a lot of training props when it comes to this, so uh, that we gather up from the counties. We have more than more than we need there, but uh, you know, we we show them the, the failures and that come right from, from the county garages. Week three is hydraulics. Uh, again, safety, safety, safety when it comes around working, when it comes to working around hydraulic systems. Schematics, we have simulators. On the safety part of it, we go through the, the lockout, tagout procedures, you know, the importance of removing the keys from the truck and uh, a lot of scary stories there too. I'm sure we all have scary stories when it comes to that. There's an example and we'll look at closer at our, our hydraulic simulators, uh, but to reinforce the lockout tagout program. There's a picture of our, our hydraulic simulators. Uh, in 2016, we bought four new boards. They're double sided, so you can have two mechanics on, on one board. The four boards uh, that we updated uh, was a, at a cost of 170,000. And if anybody, we ha still have the four old boards. If you're interested, let me know. Uh, real cheap, free. It's a good price. <laughs> but we, we updated it uh, uh, for our, our trucks and our systems. You can get two mechanics at each station. Great tool. There's another picture you know, where the mechanics can build hydraulic circuits and they're able to you know, check flow and pressures of the circuits they built and, and really get a good understanding of the importance of uh, for pressure relief cir or, yeah, pressure relief circuits. One of the activities uh, for the boards, uh, I think we have, I think it's 14 different activities that are available uh, at different knowledge levels. Again, hands-on, there's three different uh, valve sections that we use, and then hands-on with disassembly of solenoids and, or valves to simulate repairs. Cross sections, again, to help with flow path identification and internal component identification. Hydraulic filters, you know, we, we strongly emphasize uh, maintaining cleanliness of our hydraulic systems uh, and the maintenance requirements by the manufacturers and, and PennDOT guidelines. We spent a lot of time with that. Week four, diesel engines, basically. Engine fundamentals, go over you know, how they work mechanically, electronically, 
fuel system operations, subsystem, subsystems. We go into depth with our different diagnostic tools, whether it be MAC PTT or International NED, Bendix, Diamond Logic Builder, Auto Ingenuity, uh, Cummings Insight. So we spend a lot of time with that. And we also, I'm trying to think how long it's been, a couple years now, I guess. We have online training for the MAC and, and internationals. It's been kind of difficult uh, initially. Each mechanic or mechanic supervisor, uh, equipment manager, it's offered to, to all, all of the fleet equipment side. Uh, this training, uh, each mechanic, each, each individual has their own sign on um, and they can work at their own pace. But you know, with the, as busy as we all are, it's difficult to, to for the mechanic supervisors to find time for their mechanics to, to work their way through, but it's, it's been a really good program so far. We use the Dearborn adapter to connect to our trucks. Uh, we've found that that's you know, the most versatile uh, for multiple equipment platforms uh, with the features and, and the price, which we just updated the cables. Uh, we just got them a couple weeks ago. Dearborn adapter cable, and again, Adapter validation must be done every time we, you connect to a truck. Mac uh, Premium Tech Tool, we use that. Uh, you know, it's, it gives us the ability to look up software updates and, and programs and, and help to diagnose uh, active uh, fault, co fault codes. So we spend a lot of time during that training with the, on that. The mechanics have access to dealer level training, uh, both online and classroom settings. Mechanics can print out certifications, you know, print out that they completed the training. In October of this year, uh, we're sending six mechanics, uh, three from our uh, mechanic rebuild shop, and three county uh, mechanics that uh, certain counties get more involved in, in uh, repairs than others. So we're sending three from the field to, to Allentown in October to attend the MP8 engine rebuild diagnostics training. Uh, we sent folks out last year. Uh, we're sending more this year. Mac Impact, you know, they're able to look up parts, service information, and of course the online training. There's a shot of the Navistar engine diagnostics. Um, again, this, we use this program for manual regens, and uh, this is an example of the Navistar online training that's provided to our mechanics. The manufacturers' online courses get, you know, help our mechanics with repairs. And again, with these courses. The mechanic can print out a, a training certificate for each module that they complete. We're to week five. Again, week five is mandatory. Uh, this is our spreader training week. Again, safety first, whether it's from the mechanic side or, or the operator side. We've experienced some pretty bad accidents. Uh, this is an incident that happened in 2008. I use this one simply because the operator was very fortunate. He did not receive permanent damage. He was very lucky. Uh, that's, that's usually not the case. So many different things to, to simply keep people from putting their hands in the auger. And our latest, uh, this is a trucks we're receiving now is the third year for a seat switch. We put a switch, seat switch in all new trucks. Uh, and basically, uh, the first year, there's nobody in the seat that shuts down all the hydraulics. Well, we got all different sized people in the, in the trucks and some folks bouncing around and come out of the seat, all the hydraulics shut off. So we thought, okay, let's put a timer in there. That helped to some degree. But what we're doing with the trucks, the, the build for, for next year, the, instead of shutting down all the hydraulics, we're just gonna shut down the auger and the spinner because we've realized that that's an issue. You shut down the hydraulics and you, now you can't bring the wing plow in lift the front plow. We're going that route moving forward uh, with all the trucks. Here's some of the spreader controls that we use at, at PennDOT, manufactured by Certified Cirrus. We went with this in 1996 with the GL400s. That lasted for 11 years. I guess it was 2007. It was kind of a split year. The first part of the year, we were getting a GL400s and then went to the, to the uh, Freedom ACS. Uh, so in our fleet right now, we have about 700 of the GL400s, uh, about 1,300 of the ACS, uh, and now with the XDS, uh, we have about 250 of those in our fleet. 
this week we, you know, it's, it's spreader week and we really go over procedures on calibrating and repairing our systems. And that's the XDS on the left and the Cirrus on the right. And we also have about 125 Cirrus spreader systems in operation right now. So we have quite a large fleet. These two units are, are touch screen. Um, not an advertisement, it's just what we have. The other thing we do during that week, every mechanic has to go through the MAX uh, 609 training and certification. Our mechanic supervisors are proctors uh, for that, realized about a $2,500, $3,000 uh, savings per class by doing that in-house. Mobile mechanic training. So for the most part, we have the mechanic supervisor or mechanic instructor supervisor that does the majority of the new mechanic training. The mechanic instructors find themselves uh, on the road. Uh, very hard positions to fill because of the travel. Uh, between those two positions and our fleet, fleet advisors, I, really, I guess the fleet advisors spend more time on the road, but they're, the fleet advisors are on the road like 40 weeks a year. It's very difficult to be away from home that long. But the instructors, the mechanic instructors, uh, they go to each district twice a year to perform the, the, the training. We usually start in District 6 because their winter shuts off a lot sooner. We were just in District 6 a couple weeks ago for their training, uh, Philadelphia area. We allow the, the districts to, uh, they, they, well, they tell us what, where do they need training. Uh, is it electrical, is it hydraulic, is it spreader, Wh where are your needs? Uh, and we tailor our training by district uh, to whatever their needs are. Round one of this year is computer diagnostic training. So we're, we're heavy, the trainings in that includes information on factory diagnostic, service tools, parts and service, and, and all the diagnostic tools I just talked about, uh, going over all that. So that's uh, round one for 2019. Round two is not determined at this point. Uh, we're getting feedback uh, from the districts and it could be on PM procedures, it could be on hydraulics, electrical. Last year, one of our districts, because of the high turnover rates, especially at the equipment manager's position and the MEC2, or the MEC supervisor position, they felt they were falling way behind on PMs and, and properly uh, completed PMs. So we spent extra time, we spent a week out there with those folks just to get them back on, try to get them back on, on pace. So the third training is yearly that the mobile uh, instructors get involved in is our uh, regional spreader training. We try to have that in September, October, every year. Our mechanic instructors go along with the factory support staff uh, to provide, provide this training and it supplies mechanics uh, really in-depth and up-to-date information with the changing technology with calibration and setup. So everybody's prepared and ready to go for when uh, for winter traffic services. So we do that every year. Then I think the next slide I added yesterday, this came up Monday morning, our Northeast meeting, first thing. We use this uh, flock system for our oil changes, and I just wanted to throw a couple of pictures in there. All our equipment is set up with it, so we can just hook up and drain the oil, and it goes right into our waste oil tanks. Uh, but all of our equipment is spec for the flock system. That's what we use, and it's been working out uh, really well. So just wanted to throw that in there. Any, any questions? Thank you. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.